Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Julia. I was an admission officer at Haverford College, an outside reader for Emory University, and I currently work at Milton Academy, an independent boarding and day school outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. Joy has a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia and a master's degree from North Carolina State University. She works in private practice in Raleigh as a mental health therapist. And I'm so blessed to be able to work alongside both my beautiful daughters at School Match for You, a college counseling firm that I founded in 2010. This week in the news, Julie and I discuss a blog article by Rick Clark that encourages us to think like an admissions person when completing our applications and not the way most students and parents think. A listener comes in specifically directed to Lisa asking for guidance and help around mental health in the college admissions process. So Lisa will be on to answer that question for us. And for our interview phase, Marissa Salazar is back, part two of five. Marissa's doing a deep dive on five different types of visits you can take when you visit a college. Open houses, daily visits, fly-in programs, admitted student visits, and self-guided tours. Friends, I recorded this segment with Julia when I was up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And when I was editing it, I said, snap, there's eight minutes of insufferable, uneditable audio. So we lost about eight minutes of our content. It's much shorter than any other time Julia and I have these discussions. Uh, But hopefully you'll get some value from listening to my conversation with Julia. Let's transition now to what is a pretty awesome article. I have to say something before I dive into this. So um, Julia and I are, are both really big fans of Rick Clark's writing in his blog where he he attempts to to really kind of do a lot of what we're doing, which is explain how admissions works with some transparency that you don't always get, but he's such a good communicator. And so I was talking with Julia a few days ago and I said, hey, Julia, I think we should do, we should do our next article on Rick, on Rick Clark's blog. And, and then, um, and then I said, Oh, I, I can't think of the name right now. It's that really good one. She says, which one isn't really good. Yeah. Remember that, Julia? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so the the name of this one is called the college application is not a form it's your story and i'm going to not read all of it this time i'm going to read about half of it it's not that long anyway but i want you guys to capture uh the gist of this and then um julia will get your your thoughts and i'll let you take it wherever you want to go so here here and this came out, by the way, in September of 2023, so pretty recent. So Rick says, recently, I have also come to appreciate the massive disconnect between how students approach and complete the application and how it is actually read in admission offices. Students see the application as a form, and I get that because it starts the same way most forms begin. It asks you about your biographical information, like your name, your address, family details, date of birth, etc. It also looks like a lot of other forms they've seen in high school. Looks like the job form or the driver's license application, a sports or a club registration, and so on. Report your test scores. Tell us which high school you attended, etc. I like this word. I'm going to start using this. It's definitely for me. <laughs> Even after the standard details, college applications include sections with lots of lines and boxes that ask you to provide details about what you've done outside the class. These are extremely prescriptive in their character count and instructions. Formish for sure. On the Common App, which I'm guessing if you're a senior, you're using for at least some of the schools that you're considering, 
you need to quantify exactly how many hours a week and how many weeks per year that you've worked, played sports, volunteered, etc. So yeah, when you log into an online platform and begin entering and saving information, this all seems like a standard and basic form. But the truth is that at schools using holistic review where essays and supplemental responses are required, once you hit submit, the person on the other side is not reviewing your form. They are reading big caps, your story. Then he has a big, huge thing, share your story. Then it says, if you view the application as a story, it will change the entire way you approach applying to college. And it will greatly reduce some of the stress you feel along the way. Win-win. Telling a story is an opportunity. Completing a form is a task. When you log into your application this fall, I'm hoping you will think about conveying rather than completing. You are not working on your application, which is what most students say. Instead, you are telling your story. Pull 100 people and ask them to list the top 10 things they do for fun. Completing forms is not on the list. That was the understatement <laughs> of the year. <laughs> Telling, reading, and watching stories, however, different. Similarly, when you finish, you are not submitting. Forms get submitted. Sending your story on the other hand is exciting. It is something you can and should take pride in. And if you will let it, it may even be the F word. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> Stories are read. Forms are processed. Holistic admission is human. People with their own kids, hopes, worries, DNA, Instagram, food preferences. They're the ones reading your application. If you think of your application as a story, it changes how you approach this. Think about it. Nobody buys and opens a book hoping it sucks. <laughs> Nobody pays 17 bucks to go to a movie and another 24 for popcorn, candy, and a Coke in anticipation of a boring or lackluster experience. Instead, as people, we always start with the desire to see something good. So that is your job on the application. That is your job with your story. Tell them what is interesting about you. Give them a full sense of your character, what interests you, what excites you, what you hope for and how you have arrived at this point. The same way authors and directors create compelling characters in their movies, novels, or their video games. If you look at your application this way, it will help you know where to start on your activity section. It will help you figure out what you want to write about in your essay, not what you, not what you should or what they want to hear, but what you genuinely need them to know about you as a fully developed character, a.k.a. applicant. And then last part, it says toward the end, and I'm not reading the whole article, I'm reading about half of it. It says, however, my hope is that changing your perspective from completing and submitting a form to sharing your story will help. Ultimately, when you're sitting in class, and driving home from school, wondering what is happening in some distant or committee room, you will not dread the review of your form, but instead be excited for someone to read your authentic and unique story. Ultimately, you can't control it if a school you apply to gets 4,000 more apps this year and their admit rate drops as a result. You can't control if a college decides that they are going to reduce the number of students they admit and enroll from your state, or if they're gonna, they decide to admit and reduce the number they admit and enroll from your, in your major this year. But you can control how you tell your story. Think like an admissions reader. Tell your story and enjoy doing it. September 21st, 2023, Rick Clark is the AVP at Georgia Tech. Um, and Dean of Undergraduate Admissions, and we've had on three times, um, including uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, Julia, what say you? Take it where you want to go. 
Yeah, I really like this article a whole lot. Um, I really do believe that this process um, can be one of self-discovery. You are really telling your your own story and you're learning things about yourself. Um, I really like the point of the article about this being almost like if you were writing a book about yourself, right? That it doesn't necessarily end when you finish um, the story that you're conveying in an essay or whatnot, but that it requires a lot of editing and looking over and making sure that the whole application is a complete book, right? Um, I actually had this experience exactly with one of my students and it's been so fun and shout out to her. She's um, really important embracing the college process as a, a moment of self-discovery. And so every time I, you know, I talk about a new school with her and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm assigning you more homework because this school I, has a couple supplements. She gets visibly excited because she loves telling her story. And it's been such a fun time for her. And instead of her being nervous about what's going on in the committee room. She's very excited. She even came in right before we went for break and asked me like, how does it work? Like she wanted to know how they would read her story and that they would get excited too. And it is really true. I find that the students who use the process that way, or they really see the process as a, a win-win in the way um, Rick Clark mentioned it, is that they actually tend to have the best outcomes in the college process because uh, they're really treating it as uh, a, a way for them to really discover who they are, convey who they are. Um, and that lands really well, that authenticity and that um, sort of holistic narrative that really lands well on colleges. I was listening to a presentation from uh, Director of Missions at the College of Holy Cross. It really impressed me with his transparency. It reminded me a lot of Rick Clark and his transparency and some of the other people uh, Julie and I have interviewed like Lee Coffin from Dartmouth and Heath Einstein from TCU. Uh, but this Holy Cross admission officer said this. He said, you know, we tell students that we love to read their applications. But to be honest, a lot of times reading the application isn't very riveting. But you know what we do love? We love reading student essays. We love reading their story. And I find that's what most college admission officers will say that the student voice, the student writing is their favorite part of the application. Do you agree with that, Julia? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The activities list is not so riveting, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it is hard to have this level of self-awareness to really talk about your story in a compelling way. Sometimes it's actually helpful to bring someone else into the collaboration process, someone who knows you well. Maybe it's a mom or maybe a dad or maybe a cousin, or a sibling, or a friend, and you ask them a series of questions like, what do you find interesting about me? What would you say I'm passionate about? What is it that would be a travesty if I didn't include in my application so that colleges could better understand me? Julia, I've been focusing a lot more with my students in getting them to reduce their main message to what, two sentences max. One is even better. And then we can build out from there how they're going to convey their story. Do you approach working with your students where you help them identify their primary message at all? I like to call this their compelling narrative. Uh, curious to know how you help the student focus on their main message when you're working with them. Yeah, oftentimes I, what's sort of so important about this whole thing is that it's not necessarily like a narrative uh, resume. It is more about your values and your character and what matters to you. So sometimes, especially when a student is really struggling with maybe their Common App essay, um, which could really be sort of the foundation for everything else that might go into your supplements or um, sort of like what's the overall uh, sort of 360 view of me. I say to students, if you're, it's not an elevator spiel in the sense that you have 15 seconds to say about who you are, but if you had 15 seconds to convey to someone what's so important to you that someone has to know about you to understand what would that thing or those things be? And then we try to center the whole application around it um, without being redundant, right? So maybe it's, um, you know, I'm working with a student who is, uh, she practices the Baha'i faith and a lot of, um, and sort of her central tenets is sort of like 
harmony um, and being proud of uh, the whole rather than the individual. Um, And so these things all weave together, but they're basically three central values that matter the most to her, but they guide her in everything she does so that when she goes to talk about an extracurricular activity or write a supplement, she's able to use these founding principles without being redundant in the application to really kind of uh, convey how these values show up for her and how they inform who she is. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's, I mean, everything you said is, is really important. And I think another thing that can be a missed opportunity is not um, having your rec writers reinforce Mm. some of these key things that you want to emphasize because it's very powerful as a reader. If you're hearing similar um, messaging or at least articulation of passions or contributions or strengths. If you're picking up um, the same message from those who write on your behalf, that you're really good at something that comes through, or you really care deeply about something, you know, that you are like, let's say for example, um, someone has a deep passion for the homeless and that also came through in something else that came from a rec writer or maybe even a volunteer person on, and so it could be an outside, it could be an outside mm-hmm. rec writer that was the, maybe the supervisor or volunteer project you did with the homeless. That has a tendency to really land well and feel genuine and feel like, mm-hmm. okay, I feel like I'm getting who this person is, you know? Right. Um, but learning the art of s- storytelling is important. Learning how to sh- share and communicate it not only this way, but also verbally, especially mm-hmm. if you're in a situation where you're going to be asked to do an interview. Right. Right. It's this, it's the mm-hmm. same thing, you know, and remember schools want what they don't have. And so thinking about what is unique about you um, is always going to sizzle a lot more than if it's something that's real standard fair. And I realize probably students may not know what's standard fair. What's, what is it that admissions officers get all the time? Uh, right. But that would be another thing I would encourage you to, to say. So mm-hmm. any, any final closing thoughts on this one, Julia? No, I just really, I really think it's a good read. It's a short article. And I think it's a really good way, especially for our students who are just starting this process. If, if you can really structure it about your story to be told, I think you'll also have more joy and less stress in the process as you go through it. Awesome. Thank you as always, Julia. Appreciate you. Thank you, Mark. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. Lisa, I was in Durham, but we were like ships in the night there. I know. You were in Durham and I wasn't. I went to St. Louis, so um, we did not coordinate that one very well, I don't think. Well, we drove right by Durham Academy just driving. I, oh. <laughs> I think Joy might live fairly close to you. Do you know that? Do you know the Wegmans in Chapel Hill? Yes, I'm there frequently. Well, she's a half a mile from there. Okay. Well, see, this is good. So if I just need a place to hang out or yes, something, I'm just you think I'm joking. You. Knock, knock, knock. So, no, I actually <laughs> thought that on the trip. I thought, you know, at least I would really like hanging out at this place. So anyway, <laughs> sure we'll talk off air on that yeah. one. <laughs> All right. Sounds like a plan. All right, Lisa, we're just going to dive right in. And I'm going to play this question from Julia in Virginia. Hello to all the team. And thank you for such an excellent podcast. I'm a loyal listener calling from Virginia with a question about my junior's engagement with the college application process. I would be particularly interested in Lisa's take on this question as um, a mental health professional. So everything that I've heard encourages parents to allow the student to drive the process for college admissions. But I'd like to know what you do with a kid who refuses to participate. So like many kids, uh, my kids' middle school years were shaped by the pandemic and coupled with a natural tendency towards introversion, he started high school with some social anxiety. But thanks to a loving and nurturing Quaker school, he has finally hit his stride and is really living his best social life now. So when he's approached, 
about the college application process, he feels very sad and anxious about giving all this up and having to start over again. So much so that his solution is to just stick his head in the sand and refuse to discuss or even think about his choices. I have done some research on colleges to get us started, and I have taken him on a few campus visits, which make him miserable. And I don't know how to strike a balance between nudging him towards the future and being sensitive to his feelings. So any suggestions would be very welcome. Thanks very much. All right, Lisa, this one is directed to you and appropriately so. It's a great, great question. Uh, we know from doing our counseling, we can kind of tell when we hear a question that, ooh, a lot of people have that one. Yes, they do. <laughs> this is very, very common. Yeah. So I was really excited about this question. Uh, take it where you want to go. Sure. Well, um, I really appreciate this question because this is something that parents, I think, experience a lot where they're kind of knowing, like, practically speaking, it's good to start early. And that's all the advice you get. And your child is um, not on the same program as you. And a lot of times, you know, they don't want to even think about college at all. Um, and, you know, in this case, um, this child, I mean, I think had some social anxiety and, you know, maybe, you know, some social isolation during the pandemic, which contributed to that and uh, is doing great now in a supportive environment and is kind of scared um, to do anything else uh, in, in another place. So, you know, right now he's sort of in an avoidant phase. So what would I suggest uh, that Julia do? I mean, it sounds like this is all taken care of to me, but, you know, just make sure that whatever you can do to treat the social anxiety is being treated um, so that, you know, this um, child is functioning at their best socially, which it sounds like that they are. But, you know, when you have anxiety, um, avoidance is a thing that people typically do to respond to anxiety, right? So thinking about college makes him anxious or going on a college visit makes him anxious. And so he feels uncomfortable, so he avoids it by either not thinking about it or not participating in the process, and he feels better, right? So it sort of reinforces itself. And so, you know, in that sense, if she, Julia starts pushing it and taking him to a college visit every weekend, he's just going to get more and more and more avoidant, and soon, like, he won't even be able to use the letter C <laughs> without him <laughs> freaking out because anxiety generalizes, so I think, you know, it's, it's fine to take a step back. I mean, this is fall of junior year. Um, you know, you've got, he's got time to um, get started later. So I would just kind of drop it for a little bit. I would also um, think about, you know, maybe talking about it just like once or twice a month on an, like a, like a recurring appointment basis basis. Like, you know, the second Sunday of the month at 7 p.m., we'll talk about college for 20 minutes. That way you're still kind of, you know, checking in, seeing where things are at. It's not a completely dead subject, but it's predictable and it's time limited. And I think Rick Clark um, and Brendan Barnard made this suggestion in their first book, um, or I guess the, you know, in their book, because they just have one book, but they revised it. So the, I think that's a would be really good for this kid is kind of, you know, just it's a very manageable college exposure. Um, and I think I would also start talking to the school counselor. You know, it sounds like it's a really supportive school. When do they start the college process? How do they start the college process? You know, kind of let the counselor know where her son is at. Um, because I think if it's coming from outside of the parent-child relationship, you know, that's why people hire, you know, independent counselors a lot of times. Um, it just... The, the child is more receptive, you know, because, I mean, this kid seems like, you know, he's maybe nervous about leaving home, rightly so, and going someplace new. And then the, the person he's leaving is his mom, Julia. So that's a very complicated dynamic. And so school counselor, independent consultant might have a better shot at things just by, you know, being less emotionally significant. So those are, I have a couple more thoughts, but what are, what I've been yammering on for some time now. No, I want to hear from you. <laughs> what um, are your I want thoughts? to hear from you and Julia does. Well, I obviously agree with everything you said, but the other, you know, I will say when I first heard this question and I was listening to it, one thought that popped in my head, and this goes countercultural to sort of, I know how I was raised and probably how a lot of our listeners was raised, which is 
Not every kid has to go to college and not every kid has to go to college at 18 right out of high school. Yes, that was my next point. Yeah. Yeah. And I was really going to emphasize that a lot. Um, that we, and I have to admit that would have been extremely hard for me if my kids didn't want to go to college just because of the way I was raised, like both my parents were educators and I never remember one second of my life ever not having the thought that I would go to college and I would graduate. It never, ever had that thought. So that would have like blown my paradigm, but I've certainly seen a lot of people be very successful by going when they're ready and going when they have an interest in there, you know, so I was I was going to emphasize that uh, more, but then as Julia went on, she talked about the nurturing Quaker environment and he's finally hitting his stride. So then I had a little bit of change of thought and I thought this probably is somebody who probably could go to college right away. And my other thought was to try to identify what is it that's in that nurturing Quaker environment that's sort of in a positive way that's like pressing the buttons and producing the, the growth. And try to see if maybe you want to look at schools that have some of those kinds of things, or yeah, that at least was my you know. Other point. Oh, Where I didn't read your mind on this one. No, we know we don't talk yeah. ahead of time. Yeah, no. So those are my two points. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, because not every kid has to have like a huge college search, a national mm-hmm. college search. Like if yeah. he's nervous, maybe he just looks at colleges that are within like an hour of his house, um, you know, or it just applies to like one or two colleges, or you know. Like you said, like it's better to be ready to go to college and then succeed than to go when you're not ready. And then it's really difficult. Can I add one thing on that, Lisa? Yes. Another thing is if you're really not feeling ready, just to take a course, just take a course in an area where he has shown a lot of interest. Right. And a lot of times that can whet your appetite. And it could be like local community colleges can be fantastic for this yeah. kind of thing. So that Absolutely. could also be an, an option. And And once again, we're not saying that this... Like, you know him a lot better than we do, and you know how responsive he is. But all I'm saying is I wouldn't categorically rule that out of the paradigm. Um, It's better than forcing someone who doesn't want to go, because all they're going to do is drop out, waste your money, not really get a a lot of the experience. But once again, he's shown so much progress that, you know, if he keeps on his trajectory, he probably is college ready. Right. Well, you know, and I really do think that your suggestion to look for schools that have like whatever that supportive element is that works for him. Look at those schools. I mean, I, you know, you and I have visited some really sure. fantastically supportive Quaker schools, mm-hmm. even, you know, within yeah. the same philosophy that, yeah. you know, I think he might, if he visited those schools when he was more ready to do so, he might feel really comfortable there um, because there's a familiarity. So, you know, but like, yeah, just to kind of at this point, just, you know, step back, take a break. And sort of see what happens next. Let the process of his maturity kind of just see what direction that goes. Yeah, no, no, I agree 100%. So we're totally, totally on the same page on that. So anything else? you think we covered it? I feel like that's good. I hope it all works out for Julia um, and her student. Um, But this is totally normal. I mean, a lot of times I see that kids don't really start to get serious about it till maybe the summer of their junior year, even the fall of their senior year. And then they see all this bustle around them. And it's, you know, like the schools are like, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. <laughs> You're going to have to figure out something else to do. And that's when it really, people really kick into gear. And that's irritating because you're like, but if you did it sooner, it would be better, right? But if they're not ready to do it sooner, then it's just not going to happen. So we have to kind of go with what is on that one, I think. Yeah, and just to show how pressing of an issue this is, Lisa and I literally were talking, uh, well, we're recording this on a Wednesday, so two days ago on a Monday, and we were talking a lot about the SACAT conference, which is an annual admissions conference that is our entire team. We go there. This year it's in Raleigh, so big commute for you there. I know. (laughs) And, and, you know, Lisa was saying, no, I I might be interested in doing a presentation on anxiety. You know, it's something that I'm open to doing, you know, because you can do workshops. And and the only reason she was talking about doing a possible presentation on anxiety is because of how big of a need it is. Yeah. And yeah. then and then we started to have a conversation. You and I, Linda, was part of that about you know this book out here that everybody's talking about about anxieties. You know. Oh, you mean um, never enough? Never by enough. Jennifer Wallace. Yeah. 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 And how there's all this buzz around it about never enough because of the anxieties that kids are facing and. 
So it's a, it's a real problem. Our longtime listeners may know we did 10 straight weeks in a row of recommended resources related to mental health and anxiety. We had all the Lisa Damore books and all the different books, you know, that were on this topic just because, I, I mean, this is a difficult generation. You know, I was listening to, this is my slightly same out topic, but it's really not. I was listening to an interview with an author I really like a lot. And the interv- and the interviewer said to him, you know, why is it that people are reporting like so much unhappiness with their own current state when like the economy is doing well and we're experiencing a lot of prosperity in a lot of ways? And then he said, uh, social media, this generation in social media, like everything they compare themselves to is like a highlight reel for somebody else. And if that if that becomes your comparison, if that's like the normal, You'll always be, You'll yeah, always be beneath that, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like not knowing about what other people are doing probably has some positive benefits, but you know, it's just it is just like these kids have been through a lot, you know, the pandemic, I mean, the pandemic, school shootings. I know, cl- you know, like worry about the climate. I mean, it's just it's a they lot. have it, they have it hard, and you know, that's why I do think it's important to like. Every kid's going to grow at their own pace, you know, and we have to kind of respect that about that person. Like that's their individual pace. And if they get to school one year later in the scheme of their life, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And then and then on top of that, a lot of people have experienced a lot of hate, you know, whether it's, you know, there's been a lot of anti-Asian hate. There's the Israeli, you know, a lot of a lot of tension with Israelis, a lot of stuff with Palestinians. You've got the stuff with, you know, with black kids, you got the stuff with with people that are immigrants, you've got, you know, um, gay and lesbian, bisexual, trans. I mean, there's just a lot of hate and anger out there in the culture and bull- and bullying and cruelness. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. So then, like you said, you layer all that on with COVID and lay it all it on. Then a family may be going through financial anxieties, possibly, depending on what happened. It's just a lot. So, yeah, identifying what the, what's triggering the anxiety, I think working with whatever professional is helping you. A counselor, I think, would also be really important. And I know you said that earlier. Yeah. All right. All right. Hopefully it was helpful, Julia. Let us know what book you want. You get a choice. <laughs> <laughs> you get a choice until we run out. Then you'll have then you'll be then down you to one. You won't have any choices at all. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But we're hoping to restock that, but no promises yet. You wanna uh Lisa tell tell Julia what her two options are? Um, well, there's um, it's really a hard choice, I think. Um, there's two books about success in college. One is by Elliot Felix, and it's more about how to be successful in terms of taking advantage of opportunities at college and engaging with the college community. And then the book by Lewis Newman is a great book on how to be academically successful in college and how to use your critical thinking skills and how to kind of um, figure out what classes want and what the subject that you're studying kind of would emphasize and trying to use that. Um, so they're, they're both, I can't, I couldn't pick between the two, quite honestly. No, no, it's a completely individual, um, you know, given, and they're, you know, they're real high Amazon reviews to indicates just that, that both books have landed well. So yeah, just shoot a text to me at 404-664-4340, name, address, and zip code, mention the question that you added. I'm a texter. And uh, Anitra, my wife, she we have the Stamps.com membership. And so we have the office and they just go out through Stamps.com. And now that we're back, uh, we can get these out early. It was a little tough. During, I couldn't do anything when we were in Asheville and we were in Durham. But we're back. So we have a little bit of a backlog there. And if you have sent a question in and you have not reached out, please do that. Because not everybody has told us that. And, you know, just whatever. One person reached out and said, donate it to the local library. It was like, I love the idea. So whatever we can do to support you. All right. Thanks, Julia. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, if you missed last week's interview with Marissa Salazar, strongly encourage you to go back just to understand her backstory. And we really focus on open houses in part one. And in part two, you know, we continue to discuss open houses as Marissa talks about the logistics, things like when are open houses on the calendar, what months, and are there cutoff dates? We then transition to talk about overnight programs, and we talk about whether overnights are effective. 
We also discuss the challenges presented by overnights and why you so seldomly see colleges providing overnights these days. We then transition to talk about admitted student visit programs, and Marissa talks about the structure of these admitted student visit programs. She talks about the role social media plays with admitted student visit programs. Marissa talks about the structure and the various models out there for different admitted student visit programs. And Marissa talks about what students really like to see included in admitted student visit programs and open houses and what all their research clearly points to two things that students really like a lot. And she tells us what those are. And then Marissa talks about two very different models of how student panels are handled. Listen and enjoy. And for open houses, like what's the, the sign up process? What's the cutoff time? What are the dates that what are the dates that you typically do them and what's sort of like the, the cutoff date? Yeah, for sign our up. fall visits, um, they happen the same time every year. It happens over Labor Day weekend and then it happens over Indigenous Peoples Weekend. Um, just because we know folks traditionally have off from school, they might have off from work. So if families want to join, that's usually an option for them. Um, and then in the spring, it's usually the first week of April and then mid-April sometime. So for the the fall visits, it's harder, right? Like students are just getting back into the swing of things with school. Um, and so it's a little harder for them to take off, which is why we try not to apply that pressure for those families. Did I answer your question? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you did. You did. Yeah. I want to go back to something that I think I might have missed it. So did you say that you did overnights at, at one point, but sort of stopped them due to COVID? Because I know you said yes. they, you know, they, because I, you know, it's just funny. I I used to run an overnight program and I was really a believer in the correlation with yield. And I used to say, if you're going to mm -hmm. go place for four years, you should try it for a night. And a lot of other schools didn't do them. So I thought it was a little bit of a competitive advantage. But there was always debate in the office, like, are there so much work and you got to pair people up and then, you, you, you know, you, you get the wrong host and then they just say, don't come here. And then all your work goes <laughs> down like a deck of cards. So yep. I'm aware of uh -huh. like those internal debates that happen. But I'm always <laughs> happy to know that people have them because I sort of feel like that's we're confident in our environment that, you know, that we can be transparent. Because obviously you have so much that you don't control in an o in an overnight compared to a daily visit. Right. Like just who people may meet and what they might say. Yes. So I'm glad to know you did them. Was it COVID that killed it or what? Tell me the story there, because I think it sounded like you said they are the past. Yeah, they are a thing of the past. Um, yeah. So 2019, I want to say it was happening for 10 plus years on our campus. I mean, um, and I think, you know, a part of that conversation, as you mentioned, Mark, was the data behind it of knowing that 90% of students um, that attended an overnight and ended up, you know, applying were likely to commit to an inst to our institution. So that was really enticing. And I know my boss is listening to this, but I had an internal ba battle of like, these are really hard to yes. <laughs> make happen every single day. Yeah. And our students, they're students first. And I can't blame them for the last minute test that came up that they sure. had to study for. And then I'm left like, oh, like, what do I do now? Um, and so... COVID, if there was a silver lining, was that, for me at least, was that they're not happening anymore. Just, And I think a part of that is because of that safety component. We traditionally had students sleeping in sleeping bags on the floor of a dorm room, which is just a fire hazard. Um, and I think with the spread of COVID, like it just doesn't make sense yeah. anymore. So we tried to do some workarounds, but, you know, like working at a small college campus, you only have so much space. And when you're maxed out on housing every single year, there just isn't room and capacity for it. So I genuinely think that it is a thing of the past. Our fly-in program, we put them up in a hotel. Um, so there is still that overnight component for those folks. Um, but yeah, it's not happening anymore, which I'm like, boo, because students loved being on campus and going to the dining hall and doing whatever they're doing in the evening with their host. Um, but for me, I'm selfishly like, that's kind of nice. I don't have to plan sure. anymore. <laughs> no, they're a ton of work and I, I love them, but yeah. I still have some, you were talking, I was like, reliving some scars by getting blown off by a host and you're running around trying to get one of your top tour guides <laughs> to ask if they'll host it the last second. <laughs> Literally going to their dorm room, knocking on yes. their door with, with fruit snacks and yeah. Rice Krispie treats, begging them. Mm -hmm. Oh, so funny. So, you know, I was going to talk about admitted student programs last, but I think there's a lot of similarities with open houses. 
right? I know, like, we used yep. to call those all hands on deck events, like everybody has to no vacation time, like everybody needs to be there. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But talk about how admitted student visit programs and how they're different than an open house. Obviously, one major difference is you have to be been admitted to the school, but any any differences other in terms of programming? There are some slight differences, um, you know, right? You're likely not going to get an information session. You won't have a generalized tour. It's way more specialized, right? Where the information session we're providing is about uh, orientation. It's about your, what's called a pretty trip here at CC of like community service. It's about career center, global education and study abroad. It's just way more nuanced than you would get at a, you know, a fall open house. I think it's also more about community building and, this is something I've really had to rework in the past three, four years is this new generation of students, they don't want to sit in a chair and be lectured at. They want to make connections and friendships with students to find their roommate, to find their next best friend, right? To get to know the campus community and the culture. And I think that's so valid, but it's definitely a different way to approach the logistics point of an open house. I'm so used to saying, let's do a student panel and a resource sure. panel and like, let's just information overload these kids. Um, and the feedback has generally been like, please don't do that anymore. Like, or if you do, let's give a couple options, right? So I don't feel pressured to have to attend that one event. Um, and so, you know, I'm actually in the midst of planning that right now with my colleague of our schedule for admitted student open house. And most of our schedule is like lawn games and arts and crafts and really just community um, type of events where students can sit down and just create bonds. Yeah, no, the thing that's so different now compared to when I did this stuff is the social media piece. Mm, oh, and, yeah. And how, like, as soon as kids are admitted, they're, like, immediately connecting with other people that yep. were admitted. Um, do you use social media at all, proactively at all? Like, hey, here's our, welcome to our admitted Instagram page or something like that, and let people start connecting? Like, how do you do that? That Because that piece is totally foreign to me that's... You know, but I see how much it's happening. I even saw it with my own kids when they went through the process and I see it with my students. Talk to, talk to me about that. Yes. No, social media, you're so right, is like very, very prevalent in this generation. And we do interact. I am, we have Instagram. And so students usually find each other through our sort of admitted student class page. Um, we also have started to dabble in TikTok, which... Mm -hmm for me, when I attempted to do it with a student was like a crash and burn situation. They were trying to teach me how to like do choreography. And I was like, I'm too old, right? right? Like, yeah. I look ridiculous right now. But kids um, are on there. They just are. The kids love yeah, it. I know. They do. Yes. And so that is the primary platform is, is TikTok and Instagram. And so really trying to, um, you know, beef up those markets. We also know that this generation loves authenticity and just being real, uh, which is also another platform, the Be Real platform. But you know, we want our students on campus to be leading those efforts because they can see through it if it's, you know, an admission officer or, you know, it's it's being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's being monitored, I guess you could say, by an admission staff. Like we want our students to be able to, you know, create the content, post it with like just minimal hands-on supervision. So that has certainly helped when it's come to TikTok of um, they feel that authenticity from those videos. And I think that's helping them to engage more and, you know, follow us more, which is good. But that's the communications team part. Like sure. I don't really interact with that, thankfully. But yes, we are doing those things. Yeah. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, I'm in a very generous mood today. So you're getting two recommended resources and a tip. My youngest daughter, Joy, is 25 today. So our recommended resource for episode 384 are the following. The Kentucky Higher Education Assistance Authorities 2024-2025 FAFSA Walkthrough. Now, I know that was an, a mouthful. But I am very bullish on FAFSA and CSS profile walkthroughs. And what happens is an expert takes you line by line, step by step through every question. So you have your FAFSA out open and you just watch and you complete it and stop and start. And it's just the best way I know to do it. I've been recommending the Utah Higher Ed Authority for the last. You know, I always do one when the new FAFSA comes out or is about to come out. 
This year, I'm really impressed with Kentucky's. I really like this guy, Keith Ritchie. He's their assistant director of outreach. I think he just does an outstanding job explaining it in a fast, efficient 24, 25 minutes of your time. And the easiest way to find it, honestly, is just go to YouTube. You guys know I'm a fan of YouTube University. It's where I personally get a lot of my own professional development. Uh, and so I just checked out a whole bunch of them, and I really thought this one was crisp, efficient, and really, really well explained. So if you were to go to YouTube, you would just put in FAFSA walkthrough. You want to put in 2024, 20, 2025, and you could put a couple of things. You just put Kentucky, and it will pull up. Or you could put in K-H-E-A-A, which is the acronym for Kentucky Higher Education Assistance Authority. They also have a great website, by the way, K-H-E-A-A.com, where they have a number of other great resources. Now, that's one that's really, really good in an efficient, fast 24, 25 minutes. If you want something maybe with just a little bit more time, I'm recommending another one. Once again, you put in FAFSA 2024-2025 walkthrough um, into YouTube. And this time, when you see the one produced by Best College Aid, I like that one a lot as well. Uh, it's, it's about 20 minutes longer. It's about 44 minutes. Uh, but what happens in this one is they actually play a recording that the Department of Education did walking um, counselors through the new FAFSA and then the instructor stops and starts and has commentary. So they're both really, really good. You can check out both if you're hardcore, or you could try the 25-minute version. I think it will be sufficient for your needs. Another tip, you're going to need an FSA ID if you haven't completed the FAFSA. An FSA ID is an acronym for Federal Student Aid ID. It will serve as your signature. This replaces the old PIN that used to be around about five years ago. And a parent and a student are both going to need to have one. And so uh, if you don't know how to get your FSA ID, um, uh, Kentucky Higher Ed Assistance Authority has a little short, very short little uh, video on their YouTube page on how to do it. Um, you could also just Google it or you could go to studentaid.gov, which is where all this stuff comes from. Uh, but you're going to need to get that. And it can take about 72 hours uh, to get your PIN. So Perhaps is not opening up until the very, very end of December. Uh, but go ahead and get your pin now because first thing you're going to do to do when you start completing your free application for federal student aid is put in your pin. Uh, one more thing, I recommend uh, my first choice is student and parent do it together because it's all in the student's name. However, I do understand that parents may not want students to know all their financial information. So in that case, I recommend a parent do it. I do not recommend students do it without a parent because my experience is just too error prone. Almost all the questions that you're going to be asked uh, when it comes to money are all related to parent income assets, taxes, things like that. So um, there you go. You got a few tips, a few recommended resources. Uh, check it out. They're two great walkthroughs. And remember, some schools um, have a policy of first come, first serve when it comes to money being available. And there are schools that use the FAFSA to determine any need-based aid they give away. In fact, most schools actually that give away need-based aid use the FAFSA. It's only around 180 of the wealthiest schools in the country that use the CSS profile. So there you go. Let's now return to my interview with Marissa Salazar on five different types of ways to visit a college. So back to sort of open houses slash admitted student visit programs. What's the, the kind of maximum that you've found that you can accommodate? And do they like fill up like certain time in advance or, you know, you can still take people like, you know, a couple of nights before, like, how does all that work? Oh man, you're asking me. So I would say 500. If you asked our VP of enrollment, he'd probably say a thousand. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> we just, we have minimum space on sure, campus. So sure. I think usually our maximum capacity is about 500. Is that students and parents? Be, it is. Yeah, yeah. So total guest count. Yep. So parents and guests. Yeah. But I think it begs the question of like, is that too big? And, you know, is there such thing as too big? Like, are we pr still providing and giving students what they need and the resources they want? Can they still one-on-one -on -one chat with an admission counselor or a student? And so we've been more focused on that. Like, yes, we could increase our capacity, but is that taking away from the type of opportunities and experience that we're offering families on campus? So 
Um, we're looking into that, but traditionally it's been about 500 per event with total guest count. Um, we do accept walk-ins. It's very rare that we'll reach total capacity. I will say that they differ though, right? So for fall open house and in this fall, we are usually about a hundred shy from where we need to be. So we can accept usually a ton of walk-ins. For admitted student open house, however, we are usually about 20 to 25 shy from our goal of 500. So a little less likely for students to show up on the spot um, in droves, of course. Like if it's just one or two, that's fine. But um, I always recommend families if they're thinking like, I thought I couldn't come this weekend, but you know, it's the day before and I'm here and just call us, right? And I'd hate for you to show up and waste your time. And, you know, we want to make sure we're providing a good service or maybe there's someone we can pull off staff and you can't join the program, which you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation to get your questions answered or a self-guided tour, right? So I always recommend to families to give us a call beforehand. Let's get into some of the different things that, that happen, you know, so mm -hmm. financial aid. Is there, and I've seen models where somebody from financial aid speaks and there's a q and A. I've also seen models where, uh, the financial aid office is open and the officers are available. And if you want to go over there and have a chat, like this next 30 minutes is to go do that. And it's more of a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. Um, what are your, how do you guys do it? And, you know, have you seen, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we do offer financial aid sessions at both fall and admitted student events. Um, but you hit the nail on the head in our fall sessions, uh, our admission reps will do a presentation to go over CSS and mm -hmm. well, FAFSA simplification this year. Sure. Um, and then they will take sort of one-on-one -on -one questions afterwards. Our mentality for the spring is that families have their award package, they've been through the process. And so really it should just be more one-on-one -on -one conversations. And so we do a mini open house during our larger open house. So they're open from let's say 11 to four. And you can go throughout that time to schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment with them to talk about your aid package. So it varies. And I've I've seen it both ways. I've also seen the financial aid officers offer a presentation at both admitted student and fall open houses. So it depends, but we we totally understand that narrative of like, let's give them the information in the fall. Let's walk them through the steps of how to do these different um, forms and then be able to take those one-on-one -on -one questions once they've been given their award package. That's great. That's great. So what are the sort of in-demand topics, sessions, things that you've learned, like we have to do this all the time. It's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm thinking probably on the fall, people probably like sort of anything around admissions tips and advice and things like that, right? Is that sort of a, a surefire winner? There's interest there, but you know, maybe not. Tell me what, tell me what's working and what works and what doesn't work. It is hands down the student panel. That is every single survey is always the exceptional box is checked for that student panel. And I learned so much about the culture and community on campus and what it's like to be a student for the student panel. Um, and so that is something we will always make sure is incorporated in our scheduling. But you're right. In the fall, students show up and they show out to the tips on applying and the writing the college essay. Sure just because they know how important those aspects are when it comes to the application process, especially for smaller private liberal arts schools. So um, that tends to be popular. And then for the admitted student, housing. Oh mm. my goodness. Mm. They want to see the dorms on campus. And, uh, you know, historically we haven't offered housing tours just because like I mentioned, we are at capacity every year, but We've been able to rework the schedule to have a, a mini open house within the open house kind of thing where simultaneously housing, financial aid, and departments will open their doors and families can just kind of go in and explore. So that's been a really successful model um, of giving families the autonomy to choose their own day. And if they really want to see housing, they can see that. Or if they're like, no, I want to talk to the theater department, then they can go and do that. So um, I would say those are definitely some big hitters at the event. Let me follow up on your student panel comment. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I was just reflecting back even myself as a college counselor. A lot of times when I do college visits, a lot of times that student panel is, is one of the definitely one of the highlights. But I've seen a couple models with that, too. And I wondered what your thoughts. One is sort of the admission officer moderating the panel. And then the other is, we're just going to leave and close the door. And it's just you and the students. And we're not even around. 
you know, just so you can sort of feel like you know, Big Brother's not watching over you, admission mm-hmm. officer. And and so, do you have thoughts on that? Because uh, I get both of them when I'm on my visits as a college counselor. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, well, we do it the admission uh, officer moderating type of style. Yeah. But in, in being totally transparent, I do see the value of having it student led. As I mentioned before, this generation of students appreciate that authenticity and students just, as they say, keeping it 100. And I, I value that. Um, and so I, I do see us moving to a model where perhaps we could um, you know, have it student led and student run just to have those really honest conversations during our fly in program. Actually, we have affinity conversations that we step out of the room for and they can just chat about the experience on campus. Um, and it's again, that's always a highlight for students where they can be real and have those candid conversations that feeling like, oh, this is going against my application or I need to be a certain way and show I need up to be on at all space. times. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, they can just you know, turn that button off just for a little bit and just be able to have those candid conversations. So I, I would say I would value the the latter, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it always feels good when schools do that. It sort of feels mm-hmm. like, okay, you know, you really are just trying to give us the authentic, um, you know, the real deal and, and not orchestrate it too much. Exactly. Yes. Friends, when I was editing this podcast, I had a epiphany. I had a thought pop in my head. The same fear that admission officers often have about an overnight, namely, will one kid torpedo all of the tens and tens and tens of hours of work by no showing or saying this place sucks or whatever, your whole thing goes down like a deck of cards, is also similar to the same fear that can be prevalent with student panels. Now, you might think that's ridiculous. Well, I can understand it. So on a, one of the California Counselor Flying programs I went, uh, where they use this model of meet with the students and everybody leaves, I see a lot of that, uh, more than half of the schools use that model actually on my West Coast Flyings. But on one particular occasion, what the students said about the school was so, I don't know, dastardly is the word that pops in my mind. It was abhorrent. It didn't color my view of the school. I felt like I knew enough about the school, but it did for a lot of people. I don't think the admission officers to this day know what things the students said and certainly how it landed with the admission officers. But it was a buzz for the rest of the day and even half of the next day, what those students said about the school when the admission officers weren't there. And no, I tried to be as transparent as possible. Don't text me. Don't email me. I'm not telling you the school. But anyway, those are some of the debates that go on when you try to decide whether to do an overnight program or whether to do an admissions panel led student panel or whether to just let students be there. Uh, it's interesting because we we actually did the overnights. We did it and did it uh, willingly. It was a lot of work. But there's no way in the world that my director was ever going to leave a student panel without uh, her guiding that or another uh, senior leader guiding it. So yeah, different schools make different decisions. But I also see the value to the other type as well. I was more involved in that type of the moderator kind of thing. Um, so yeah, you can make a case for, for you know, for, for either one. Friends, this concludes part two of my five-part interview with Marissa Salazar as overall the visit programs at Colorado College. We're talking all things college visits. And I hope you'll join us next week for part three of five. On Monday's episode, Julia and I are going to answer two questions that we frequently are asked. One is, what's the shortest my personal statement can be? I know 650 words is the longest, but is there such a thing as too short? And the second question is, what advice do you have for me if a college gives me an option of uploading a resume? And here's a little tease, friends. Julie and I agree 99.5% of the time on stuff. That's maybe a bit high, but you know, we agree a lot. But we don't completely see this question eye to eye. So kind of like that when it happens, because you as a listener get to hear a couple of different perspectives and think through the issue. And of course, we'll have the final part of Linda's interview with Derek Terrell. He works for the Coalition. 
and he's helping us to understand the Coalition for College. Okay, friends, we're up to quote 12 of 15 on the personal statement. Another giant of the profession, Sean Abbott, formerly of NYU, then at Temple, and now at Tulane. Um, and here's another good one. It's short and sweet and right to the point. The biggest mistake is simply to rehash your resume. It's lazy and it's not creative. There's ample amount of real estate on any application for you to talk about your resume like experiences in other sections. The essay is your form to tell an admission officer and committee a story. And that perfectly harmonizes with the message from Rick Clark, who, by the way, is tight with Sean Abbott. So there you go. Both gentlemen saying, tell your story. See you on Monday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.